Thank you so much, Kanchit, and thank you to all of you for being here tonight. It's so wonderful to see, to see this room filled. Um, now, I feel like I should start off by saying that I realize that it may not be immediately obvious why we are linking genetics on one hand to identity on the other. Because after all, why would we expect that our body's processes of translating molecular information into instructions for producing proteins on one hand to have anything to do with the social labels that we group ourselves by. So, you know, why not be here to link other bodily process like fingernail growth or earwax production? Uh, why, you know, why genetics? In a wonderful 1995 book entitled The DNA Mystique, The Gene as Cultural Icon, our late NYU colleague, Dorothy Nelkin, a sociologist, along with Susan Lindy, explained what, just what was so special about genes. They traced the many metaphors that are used to describe DNA, for example, as the code of codes, as a dictionary, as a recipe book, as the book of life, as a Bible. In other words, as some kind of text that predicts, if not determines, our characteristics and our faiths. And in doing so, Nelkin and Lindy came to the conclusion that the gene had become the contemporary symbolic equivalent of the age-old notion of the soul. As they wrote, and I quote, independent of the body, DNA appears to be immortal. Fundamental to identity, DNA seems to explain individual differences, moral order, and human fate. Incapable of deceiving, DNA seems to be the locus of the true self, unquote. And if we add to this the fact that our DNA is also a legacy from our ancestors, we inherit it, albeit imperfectly and in complex ways from our parents, then we can begin to understand why the gene has come to be so closely tied to questions of identity. Now, another prominent NYU sociologist, our alumna, Alondra Nelson, who was a doctoral student of Dorothy Nelkins and is now the president of the Social Science Research Council in New York, has written that DNA has social power, prestige, authority, legitimacy. And in addition, Nelson argues, DNA has something that she calls a social life. For her, the icon of the gene travels across the globe to be shaped in the hands of everyone from amateur genealogists in the United States to German police detectives to citizenship granting officials in Sierra Leone. So its cultural meanings have come to be intertwined with structural efforts around the world to define people, to define relationships, and to define positions. And that's really what this two-day symposium, of which tonight's event is a part, is really about. We've brought together biological scientists, social scientists, and humanists from around the world to advance a global conversation about how genetics shapes our notions of identity, and by extension, how, they shape, how it shapes the practices and institutions that are informed by these beliefs of genetics. I would also submit that we're here to reflect on how our understandings of identity, in turn, shapes our conduct of genetic research. And so we are really delighted to have you here tonight to join that conversation with us. Now, I now have the honor of introducing two scholars who are eminently well-placed to help us address these questions of genetics identity. I'm going to introduce each of them in turn before their remarks. And so I'll start first with Professor Kwame Anthony Apia, who is our dear colleague at NYU, uh, where he's been professor of philosophy and law since 2014. Uh, he has taught here at NYU Abu Dhabi and at other of uh, NYU's uh, global sites, or global, global campuses. He taught previously at the University of Ghana, uh, at Yale, at Cornell, Duke, Harvard, and Princeton. And as you can imagine, this is someone whose biography and scholarly background is a little bit difficult to sum up in the few minutes I have allotted. And so what I've done is take the liberty of seizing on three things that I found particularly interesting that I wanted to share with you about Professor Apia. Um, and I think that they will help give you a, a broader sense of his, of his stature. The first thing I'd like to say is that Professor Apia is as preeminent a figure in the fields of African and African-American intellectual history and literary studies as he is in the areas of the philosophy of language, 
of ethics, of political philosophy, and the philosophy of the social sciences. This wide scholarly range is, is really apparent in his many books, and I'll just uh, name a couple, um, including his 1992 book, In My Father's House, his 2006 Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers, his 2010 book, The Honor Code, How Moral Revolutions Happen, and I would like to draw special attention to his recent 2018 work, The Lies That Bind, Rethinking Identity. So clearly of special salience for us. The second thing that I'd like to say about Professor Appiah is that I think he does the, philo the philosophical equivalent of what people in my discipline call public sociology. That is, he gives very generously of himself in making philosophical ideas and precepts and arguments available to a broader public beyond the ivory tower of academia. He lectures nonstop around the world. He's contributed to projects from the Dictionary of Global Culture to an annotated catalog of 7,500 proverbs in Chui, the language of Asante. He sits on countless boards and committees, including the 2018 Man Booker Prize Selection Committee, and this year he's gonna be serving on the jury for the Aga Khan Award for Architecture. And I can't help but think that this very public-facing work um, was important in his, being, in his being granted a National Humanities Medal from US President Obama in 2012, and in being recognized on multiple lists of top global thinkers. Now, you may also know him as the ethicist for the New York Times Sunday Magazine, where he somehow manages to write a weekly advice column. So I suspect that Anthony Appiah is probably the closest thing that contemporary philosophy has to a household name. I, I think we'd hard-pressed to come up with someone more widely known. The very last thing that I'd like to note about Professor Appiah is his family and the role that it plays in his scholarly reflection. His is a very global family, as he tells us, he has relatives in Ghana, Namibia, Nigeria, Hong Kong, England, and the United States. And in his writing, you get the very strong feeling that the history and experiences of his family in Europe and in Africa and elsewhere have not only marked him profoundly, but that they're an ongoing source of inspiration for him and the object not only of his deep affection, but even his deep reverence. And that's not something that you can say about a lot of academic writing, but it gives his his work an undeniable power. And it makes his treatment of the concept of identity all the more compelling for us, his readers. So I'd like to invite Professor Apia to the stage and thank him for being with us this evening. Thanks very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much for those very kind words. Uh, I should say that if my <laughs> If, if my name is a household name, it's the ethicist. <laughs> people often, I often meet people and I'm talking to them and they say something, they say, ah, so you're the ethicist. So um, they don't know the ethicist's name. Um, well, I'm very glad to be here. I'm delighted at the, this conference and thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, as Susan Gelman has argued in her fascinating book, The Essential Child, by the age of six, children everywhere treat races as possessing inborn features inherent in the person and passed down from parent to child. Young children, she argues, also essentialize these groups, by which she means they believe that the outer characteristics by which they assign people to groups reflect inner properties that explain both appearance and behavior. So there's a large set of ways of classifying people all around the world and throughout history that reflect this human cognitive predisposition. Now, by folk races, I want to mean those informal categories that are based on the idea that membership of a group is determined by intrinsic properties inherited from one's parents, um, properties that are shared by all normal members of the group. And using this uh, terminology, we can say that uh, Sorry, I've just lost my place. Um, we can say that uh, the hypothesis that there are human folk races is the hypothesis that there are human groups of common ancestry that are roughly definable by shared inherited, inherited intrinsic properties. 
Now, biological subspecies, as evolutionary biologists have conceived of them, are not likely to be folk races. That's because membership in a subspecies is not an intrinsic property, but a relational one. A sub subspecies is a kind of biological population. In a sexually reproducing species like us, a population is a collection of organisms whose members have a significantly higher propensity to reproduce with opposite sex members of the group than to reproduce with uh, organisms outside the group. And as a result, two organisms that are quite alike in their intrinsic biological properties can belong to different populations, and two organisms that are quite dissimilar in properties can belong to the same population. Indeed, you can have two organisms, A and B, in the same population, where A is far more different in intrinsic properties from B than from C, but which is not in the population at all. Imagine a population split in two by the uh, sudden appearance of a deep river formed after an earthquake. Consider A, B, and C, who were members of the original population before the split. Suppose A and C are close kin, but A and B have no recent common ancestor. Suppose that A and B are now on one side of the river and C is on the other. Well, organisms that can't meet can't mate. So A and C belong to different populations now, even though they're more like each other, and A and B belong to the same population, even though they're quite different. So, now, folk classifications in the contemporary United States are quite typical of the sort of folk race classifications that I mentioned just now. We assign people to races in a way that's governed by this rule. If your parents are of the same race, you're of the same race as your parents. Since you get your genetic endowment from your parents, racial identities governed by this rule will sometimes be statistically correlated with genetic characteristics, provided there are genes in the local members of a folk race that are commoner than in the general population. Since we often assign people to racial groups in part on the basis of physical, visible characteristics that have a uh, genetic basis, there will often, in fact, be such correlations. But people are inclined to suppose not just that there are biologically based features of people that are statistically characteristic of their race, but also that those features extend far beyond the superficial characteristics on the basis of which racial categorization is usually done. So we essentialize race in Gelman's sense of that term, and a great deal of what people believe about the biological basis of these deeper differences is false. Because the central beliefs of many people about folk races are mistaken in these ways, we cannot explain how people are assigned to races by revealing some folk theory and supposing it to be roughly true. So, since folk races are, like it or not, an important feature of our social landscape, we need an account of the racial categories actually in place that is consistent with the pervasiveness of these erroneous beliefs. So here is such an account. Folk races are an important kind of social identity. They are interesting as identities, whether or not they are interesting for biological purposes. My explication of social identities explains how they work by talking about the labels for them. This is actually an insight from sociology. So take a representative label, I, typical philosopher's imagination, I for identity, and, um, uh, uh, and consider this. Uh, there will be I want to mention three things. There will be criteria of ascription for the term, that is, there will be bases on which the term is applied. Some people will identify as eyes, that is, they will think of themselves as eyes, and others will sometimes treat people as eyes. And finally, there will be what I'm going to call norms of identification. Now, I'm going to explain each of the red terms here in a little bit more detail, ascription, identification, treatment, and norms of identification. So. A person's criteria of ascription for a property, like for, for, for an identity like I, are properties on the basis of which she sorts people into those to whom she does and those to whom she doesn't apply the label. These criteria of ascription need not be the same for every user of the term, and in general they aren't. Here is what characterizes knowing what this identity term I means, what linguists would call competence with the term. 
there will be certain kinds of people who we can call prototypical eyes, such that your criteria of ascription must pick them out for you to count as understanding the label. There'll be other kinds, let's call those antitypes, that your criteria of ascription must exclude. But because prototypes and antitypes don't always divide logical space into two, two uh, there'll be criteria of ascription that need not divide actual people into eyes and not eyes. Rather, they divide everybody into roughly three classes. Some people are in the positive class of our, and they're the eyes. Some people are in the negative class, they're decisively not eyes. But they may leave some people in a neutral class as neither determinately eyes or determinately not eyes. Um, and I shall say that someone who has criteria of ascription for an identity term I that meets these conditions has a conception of an I. And my point is that people can have different conceptions of an I, but uh, provided the I, the term, they use the term consistently with the prototypes and antitypes, um, they count as having a conception of the same kind. So here's an example. Take the term South Asian as used by Johnny from Cornwall. Um, he's never met many people from anywhere in Asia, and he hasn't met many British Asians either. He says, South Asians are a race. And he ascribes the term South Asian to everyone who looks the sort of way most movie stars in Bollywood movies look. He also thinks that the label applies to anyone whose ancestors for many generations have come from, from India, because he supposes that everybody in, the, in that country would look Asian to him, would look like somebody in a Bollywood movie. Now, Johnny will get many of the prototypes and antitypes right. You give him a Bangladeshi, he'll say South Asian. A, a typical Bangladeshi, he'll say South Asian. If you give him a Swede or a Congolese, he'll say not South Asian. So he's competent. But presented with an Andamanese, he might not know what to say. So his conception has a neutral class, even though he doesn't know it. That is, there's a class of people he wouldn't he doesn't know they exist, but if he was presented with them, he wouldn't be able to say either that they were South Asian or that they weren't. He would just be puzzled because of something he doesn't know. Now, by itself, a way of classifying people that works in this way by ascription wouldn't produce a social identity. Um, what makes it a social identity is that being an I figures in a certain typical way in people's thoughts, in feelings and acts. When a person thinks of herself as an I in the relevant way, we can say she identifies as an I. And what that means is she sometimes feels like an I, she feels like a South Asian, um, and she sometimes acts as an I, acts as a South Asian. And when I say someone acts as an I, I mean that the thought, because I am an I, figures in her reasons for do thing, doing things. So sometimes people do things because they're British like um, vote for Brexit. <laughs> Perhaps someone never acts as a British person, but feelings, as I say, can constitute identifications too. So uh, suppose someone discovers that hundreds of thousands of Brits responded to the Asian tsunami by sending money, she can feel proud of being British. That's not doing something, it's feeling something. Um, so, uh, so, um, Similarly, our treatment of and feelings about other people reflect identity. And that's what makes identities uh, social, as I say. You treat someone as an I when, because she's an I, figures in your reason for doing something to her. So, uh, for example, uh, kindness is a form of treatment as directed very often to members of an in-group. Why am I being nice to this person? We're the only two Americans in the room. Um, but also, of course, immoral unkindness is a very common freak, uh, frequent form of treatment as um, homophobia, sexism, racism, and the like. Now, I think it takes all of these things, ascription, identification, and treatment, for a label to be functioning as the label for a social identity. And one reason identities are useful is that they allow us to predict how some people will behave and one reason that is, is that social identities are associated with norms for identification. And that's the final account in my explication of what a social identity is. There are things that people ought and ought not to do as 
eyes. These, um, these ought, this is not a special moral ought. Uh, so let me just give some examples. Negatively, men ought not to wear dresses. Gay men ought not to fall in love with women. Jews ought not to embarrass the race. Positively, men ought to open doors for women. Trans people ought to come out. Blacks ought to support affirmative action. Now, to say that these norms exist is evidently not to endorse them. I don't happen to endorse any of those norms. Uh, I don't myself uh, feel inclined to insist on any of those things. Uh, what I mean by saying that the norm exists is just to say that um, it's widely thought and widely known to be thought that many people believe in them. Now, can we tell a story about racial identity that shows it to correspond roughly to a biological property of genuine interest? So I'm saying racial identities are these things where you have, um, uh, which meet all these conditions, but the, uh, the racial ones that meet all these conditions. Could it turn out, could they, they can correspond roughly to a biological property of genuine interest? If so, you could say that there was a sense in which uh, races were biologically real. And it's in answering this question that uh, work on the human genome strikes some people as helpful. Genomics teaches us not only what genes are, but also how they tend to be associated with, with each other. It teaches us about the statistical structure of the distribution of the human genome. And this offers the prospect of associating certain social groups statistically with genomic features. And where those statistical correlations are distinctive enough of the group and the genomic feature is of importance, for example, for medical reasons, there can be an obvious sense in which biological claims about the group can turn out to be statistical truths. This has been part of folk wisdom for quite a while, for a few cases like sickle cell disease or uh, glucose 6-phosphatase deficiency or Tay-Sachs, which are both rare in human beings generally, but much more frequent in some groups of common ancestry than in others, and so obviously are some of the many genes for skin color. Um, statistically, differentially distributed among the things we call races. Sometimes the groups in question are quite small. There are alleles that have been found in certain families and nowhere else. And sometimes the groups are large. Yoruba people, of whom there are more than 30 million in southwest Nigeria, have a 6% um, sorry, let me go to this. Uh, have a 6% frequency of the gene for hemoglobin C which produces a relatively mild blood disease uh, even in heterozygotes if they carry two copies of it. Um, and uh, though it, if you have hemoglobin C and hemoglobin S, that's not so great. Um, and 25% of the population of Nigeria as a whole carries the gene for hemoglobin S, which produces the classic and serious form of sickle cell disease in heterozygotes. Now, um, of course, a majority of members of the folk race of African Americans have relatively dark skin for genetic reasons. Biological remains that contain some of the genes that characteristically account for this darker skin can therefore reasonably be identified for forensic purposes as having been socially African-American uh, because uh, we can predict what they would have looked like and we can predict that in the United States, people who look like that are likely to be treated as African-American. So here there is a genuine biological trait that can be used to identify a genuine social trait, even though the social trait is not identical with any intrinsic biological property. So the utility of genetic properties in identifying a social group doesn't entail that the social group has a shared and distinctive biology. This is all consistent with recognizing that many Afro-Americans do not carry the genes for darker skin, and there are other genomic characteristics that are statistically dis distinctive of African populations that a person of African ancestry may share without having the skin color genes, and that you can be an African American while having many fewer of the genomic characteristics statistically distinctive of an African population than many people who are identified as white. All those things are, could also be true. Um, so if uh, um, just a Quick reminder that um, a, 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 a SNP refers to um, a site on a chromosome where, which is occupied in different people by different bases, and so uh, enter the various bases that can be there. And by May 2017, I looked it up, there were some 324 million reference numbers for human SNPs in the dbSNP uh, database. And the word haplotype, just to introduce another piece of terminology, is most often used like this. To say two people have the same haplotype is to say roughly that they share a distinctive collection of SNPs on a small length of a single chromosome. 
Since the genes in short regions of chromosomes seldom get separated in cell division, your haplotype in this sense is almost certain to be derived from a single parent. As a result, when a SNP arises by mutation in an ancestral chromosome, it provides a marker for descendants of that ancestor, so long as it doesn't undergo further mutation and the sequence of genes that includes it doesn't get broken by crossing over. And this is one basis on which you might propose that an African-American might seek to identify ancestral ties to a particular place in Africa where a SNP or a haplotype has been identified. Now, many contemporary Af uh, African-Americans have come to take an interest in Yoruba religion, especially in the form mediated by Haitian voodoo and the Afro-Brazilian traditions of Bahia. To discover that you have SNPs associated with a haplotype distinctive of contemporary Yoruba land would be, for many African-Americans, therefore, an exciting discovery. But Yoruba identity provides a good paradigm of the difficulties faced by those seeking an African identity through the Human Genome Project. The HapMap Project, which worked for three years from 2002 to develop a haplotype map of the human genome, had a site in Ibadan in Nigeria, a site that is predominant, a city that is predominantly Yoruba identified today. And the 90 or so individuals and 30 families whose genes were sampled there identified themselves as having four Yoruba grandparents. So the theory is simple enough. Find haplotypes that are common in Ibadan today and that have not been found elsewhere. While there will be contemporary Yoruba people who don't have this polymorphism, it's unlikely, extremely unlikely, that anyone that does carry it does not share ancestry with those that do. For someone not descended from the ancestor to have the haplotype, they would have to have both the same sequence of alleles and have an ancestor who had the same SNPs produced by mutations at exactly the same loci. With many millions of SNPs already validated, that is fantastically unlikely. The empirical conditions under which this sort of thing can be reliably done are, however, quite constraining. You must first be sure that you have identified haplotypes that are in fact distinctive of a certain population. To do that, of course, you have not only to have detailed knowledge of the genome in Yoruba land, but also knowledge of the genome in other, especially nearby, places. That is the sort of uh, information that genomics can provide. So here's a map of the distribution of hemoglobin C. Um, notice that if a SNP uh, 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 originated with a mutation, say 100 or even 1,000 uh, or even 500 years ago, it may in fact be very widely dispersed. So for example, some significant number of the contemporary descendants of that common ancestor might have been living hundreds of miles west of their distant cousins for several centuries. Suppose that the reason you share the Yoruba haplotype is that you are descended from someone who was born in what is now the country of Benin in the early 18th century. Then, while your ancestor may well have had cousins in what is now called Yoruba land, he never identified as Yoruba. For despite the antiquity of many Yoruba traditions, Yoruba identity was itself developed in the last 100 years. There was nobody who called themselves Yoruba before the 1920s or so. Of course, the city of Ife, now regarded as the origin and heartland of the Yoruba people, the entrance to the city, it says, welcome to the homeland of the Yoruba race, uh, was founded at least a million, millennium ago. But the city-state that was there in the 11th century was superseded in the 14th century by the kingdoms of Oyo and Benin, each of which traced the ancestry of its royal lineage to Ife. As Benin declined, Oyo became the dominant state in the region, and by the early 18th century, the kings of Oyo were being paid tribute by the kings of Dahomey, a practice that continued well into the 19th century. As a result of warfare and trade in the region, including the trade in slaves, some men traveled widely and took wives from or had children in political communities other than their own. Dahomey, a major slave trading state, sold people from Oyo to Obenin into the slave trade. But it was only in the 20th century that people in southwest Nigeria who spoke related dialects of the Yoruba language began to think of themselves as a single Yoruba nation. Now suppose that your haplotype with some of its distinctive SNPs is very likely derived from someone who has many descendants in Ibadan today. Even if your ancestor had been taken from near Ibadan in the 18th century, he would never have thought of himself as Yoruba. So simply put, the interpretation of the haplotype data depends that you know a lot of non-biological history. A couple of thousand years ago, 
and smelting people moved south from somewhere north of the Bight of Biafra and started migrating south and east into equatorial Africa. We call this the Bantu migration because in many of the languages spoken by their descendants, from Congo south to the Cape, the word for people is Bantu. Haplotypes distinctive of this ancestral population could be spread across half the continent. The Indebele of southern Zimbabwe are largely descendants of migrants from Zululand who escaped from Shaka in the early 19th century. So haplotypes distinctive of Zululand might be found in a person whose ancestor was taken into slavery from Zimbabwe and went through Angola to Brazil, as many people did. Because pre-existing ethnic solidarities were strongly discouraged among slaves in the New World, they were deliberately introduced into groups of multiple origins and discouraged from holding on to their mother tongues. As a result, by the 19th century, many slaves in the Western Atlantic would have had ancestors from a variety of African societies. And finding that one has ancestry in one place is interesting, I suppose. But given these facts, it seems odd to insist that this is where one is really from. You have over a thousand slots on your family tree 10 generations back around 1750, when the Atlantic slave trade was rising to its height. Around a thousand years ago, there are a million. More than this, the population that we call African American is likely to have 18th century ancestors from many parts of Europe and from many American Indian populations as well. And the converse is also true. It's been argued that there are as many US citizens who identify as white descended from American slaves as there are who identify as African American. This is a consequence of two things. The fact that you may claim African American ancestry if just one of your parents is African American and the fact that many people who could have claimed that ancestry chose beginning in the 19th century to identify as white because their skins were light enough for them to do what we call passing. As a result, while not many white Americans are going to go hunting for Yoruba haplotypes in their genomes, perhaps 30 or 40 million of them in fact have haplotypes derived from ancestors born in Africa 500 or so years ago. If you grasp these points, you're likely to notice that racial identities in social life tend to be configured in a way that takes account of these sorts of contradictions. In practice, for example, race-like social identities in social contexts are important to patterns of solidarity. And in these contexts, people whose partially genetically determined physical appearance doesn't fit the physical stereotype of the group are counted in or out in part on the basis of whether they identify with the interests of the group and in part by their utility to the group. So Walter White, the mid-century leader of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the leading African-American rights organization of the 20th century, whose name was one of his many ironical inheritances, wrote in his autobiography on page one, I am a Negro, my skin is white, my eyes are blue, my hair is blonde, the traits of my race are nowhere visible upon me. In the ballad of Walter White, African-American poet Langston Hughes put it more succinctly, now Walter White, is mighty light. <laughs> As claims to be able to settle issues of ancestry by genomic an analysis become more common, it'll be interesting to see whether the appeal of the determinateness and objectivity of scientific claims will come to override more flexible and interest relative folk understandings, or whether, on the other hand, people will become increasingly clear about the gap between folk races and the interest of biology. Despite the famed religiosity of the United States, Americans also live, many of us, in a scientific civilization. That's one reason I suspect that people want the categories they care about to be scientific. There are, as I've suggested, ways in which folk race might be connected with biological things, but current biology, even after the genome project, is very unlikely to endorse race-like categories that are essentialized in the psychologist sense, or to find much interest in human subspecies, given the rather low barriers to gene flow between human groups over the evolutionary timescale. If you want to say there are races, understand race, I suggest, as a social identity. But know that as biological and historical knowledge about them is diffused, the criteria of ascription associated with them are going to change. Know also that as long as they are essentialized, they won't correspond to classifications that are likely to be central to theoretical biology, though the statistical distribution of their haplotypes may, from time to time, be of, say, medical interest. I began with social psychology, moved on to talk some metaphysics and ethics of social identity, then talked about some recent biology, and ended with some history of Africa and the Atlantic diaspora. <laughs> 
I've not done justice to the details in any of these disciplines because I've been trying to keep my eye on the big picture, which involves all of them. One reason that discussions of race and biology have been confused, I suspect, is because you need materials from so many different fields to make sense of our folk concept of race. Philosophers are in the habit of raiding other fields for knowledge in this way, so I'm happy to be a philosopher. But people who work in interdisciplinary fields like African American studies make connections in similar ways, which is why I have so much enjoyed working with colleagues from many disciplines in that field over the years. We couldn't bring these many kinds of knowledge together if psychologists, linguists, ethicists, semanticists, biologists, and historians weren't doing specialized work in their disciplines. Still, sometimes we need to bring the specialities together, and the university is the right place to do it. For the life of the mind has many strands. As an individual brings together many haplotypes, the university is a happy intermingling of many disciplines. Thank you very much. Wonderful note to end on. It is a special pleasure for me to introduce to you Jonathan Marks, a professor of anthropology at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte since 2000, because I have been teaching his work for years. He continues in the footsteps of those anthropologists who challenged conceptions of race earlier in the 20th century. And he was among the very first scholars to engage the question of how new knowledge of human genetics in the late 20th century might influence our beliefs about human difference. And more than simply recognize the potential for such a connection, he was really one of the first to get out in front of it. That is, to actively work to shape public and scientific discourse about race and about DNA by writing about genetics in a clear and accessible way. Simply put, there's hardly anyone more qualified than he is to help us answer the question at the heart of our symposium this week, that is, what is, what is it that genetics can tell us about identity? And perhaps more to the point, what can genetics not tell us about identity? With a bachelor's degree in natural sciences, and master's degrees in genetics and in anthropology, and a PhD in anthropology, Professor Marx really models the bridging of social and biological scientists, sciences. He's a physical anthropologist whose research and teaching focus on human evolution and general biological anthropology on one hand, and also on critical historical and social studies of human genetics, genomics, evolution, and variation on the other. Now, as I've already suggested, a constant thread in his work has been his engagement with questions of racial difference, and he's been a, really a tireless champion for bringing anthropology's insights to a wider audience and for casting an informed and critical eye on simplistic claims about human nature. I'm a great fan of his 1995 book, Human Biodiversity, Genes, Race, and History, which I use in my teaching. And among his many other books, I'd also like to draw your attention to three others in particular, all with, I think, terrific titles. His award-winning 2002 book entitled, What It Means to Be 98% Chimpanzee, How We uh, Apes People and Their Genes. His 2015 Tales of the Ex-Apes, How We Think About Human Evolution. And I would like to draw your attention to his recent 2017 wonderful volume, Is Science Racist? Now, I don't think that Professor Marx knows this, but before this book went to press, his editor called me to ask me what I thought about the title. And being kind of a conservative gal myself, I thought it was a little edgy. Um, I thought it might offend some people. Um, but now that I've had the opportunity to read the book, I'm so glad that the editor ignored my opinion. Because as is typical of Jonathan Mark's work, it raises this important question in a way that opens up a productive dialogue rather than foreclosing debate. Now, the last thing that I'd like to note about Professor Marx has to do with the institutions to which he's contributed his expertise. Prior to joining uh, UNC Charlotte, he taught at the University of California at Berkeley and at Yale University. He's a very active member of the American Anthropological Association. And he's also been a visiting fellow at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin and the ESRC Genomics Policy and Research Forum in Edinburgh. But 
I believe that this is the first time we are hosting Professor Marx here at NYU Abu Dhabi. So I'd like to thank, ask you for your cooperation in giving him a very warm round of applause by me of, of welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks. I can't wait to hear your comments. Ah, wow, what a big crowd. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Anne, and thank you very much for the uh, invitation to be here. Um, I'm a genetic New Yorker. <laughs> and um, so I'd like to, sh uh, to begin by sharing something personal uh, with you. My dad is 94 years old and bedridden. But he graduated from NYU in the class of 1948. Let's see, how do we, how do we go? So, hang on. There we go. And that, uh, what you see in that picture is the old Uptown Bronx campus library uh, in the background. And my dad is delighted that you all have invited me out here uh, to visit the NYU Abu Dhabi campus. And so I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today here on his behalf, it gives him a lot of pleasure to know it. Um, anyway, let me tell you a bit about my own intellectual trajectory and how I came to be thinking about who we are and, frankly, why anyone would turn to genetics to answer that question. Obviously, genetics has something important to contribute to identity in a literal, naturalistic sense. This blood came from this body. This man is the father, or at least the genitor, of this child. But genetic identity is a small and often trivial part of the puzzle of who you are. For example, some of you may know that you're an ape. <laughs> Plenty of science books say so. A, a special ape, a slightly modified ape. What initially interested me empirically early in my career was indeed our intimate genetic relationship to the apes. Blood, of course, is both a powerful metaphor for genetics and a microcosm of genetics. And by the 1920s, it was known that the bloods of human and chimp were more similar to one another than the bloods of horse and donkey. In fact, that the bloods of chimp and human were more similar than the bloods of chimp and orangutan. The major textbook in my field actually reported this in 1946, very casually. The blood of orangutans suggests that it branched off as a separate line from chimp and human fairly early. But you see, nobody derived the inference that because of this, we are apes. Now, that intimate immunological, biochemical, genetic relationship was rediscovered in the early 1960s, but with a new meaning attached. Now it went, we are genetically apes, and therefore we are apes. In a famous deduction by the biochemist Emil Zuckerkandl, from the point of view of hemoglobin, we are simply aberrant gorillas. Now, this was ridiculous to leading evolutionary biologists in the 1960s, like Julian Huxley and George Gaylord Simpson, who were stunned to learn that there are scientists who cannot just tell humans from gorillas. After all, if your data don't permit you to distinguish Clark Gable from a gorilla, why not simply look at something else that does? So Simpson denies that we are apes in monosyllables to make sure you understand it. One, your ancestors were apes, but you're not your ancestors. After all, evolution is fundamentally about how descendants come to be different from ancestors. And two, why privilege genetic relationships over anatomical or cognitive or ecological relationships? After all, if you're so impressed by how overwhelmingly similar human and chimp are genetically, try explaining it to the chimp. 
and you will be less impressed very quickly. No matter how intimate the genetic and phylogenetic relations may be, and Simpson acknowledged the essentially modern relations, the fact remains that your life is very different from an ape's life. You can either be impressed by the genetics, which shows what a temporal outlier the orangutan is, or you can be impressed by the rest of the biology, like the ecology, which shows what uh, uh, an outlier humans are. There we go. Okay. The assumption that the genetic similarity should be the transcendent scale that overrides the anatomical, intellectual, and ecological differences between human and ape is a very debatable point. But we never actually had that debate in science. Why not? I think the answer is something that some of you older folks may remember, namely the Human Genome Project. And I don't mean here the information about the genome, but rather the publicity machine behind it that was geared towards convincing the public that $3 billion spent towards sequencing the human genome would be the greatest $3 billion ever spent. And a veritable cottage industry of books by journalists and historians and even molecular biologists telling us how important the Human Genome Project would be in purple prose and in books breathlessly titled with the metaphors and promises, codes, maps, ultimate knowledge. The Human Blueprint, the Book of Man, the Code of Codes. What does that even mean? Mapping our genes, and my favorite for the absurdly mixed metaphor, mapping the code. <laughs> At the risk of getting sidetracked, I raised the Human Genome Project as an answer to the question I posed a few minutes ago. How did the deduction, we are genetically apes, therefore we are apes, go from being absurd in the 1960s to being profound in the 1990s? And it was the Human Genome Project in the late 1980s that began to co-opt for a generation the question of whether your DNA sequence was the most important thing about you. Because of course it is. That's why we need the $3 billion. And that's how the Human Genome Project introduced to a significant extent the modern era of fake science news. James Watson who has a Nobel Prize and knows more about DNA than any of us, told Time Magazine in 1989, we used to think our fate was in the stars. Now we know in large measure our fate is in our genes. As if we now know that we have fates, they've been localized to our cellular nuclei, and molecular genetics is just like astrology, only presumably more accurate. And Watson was so proud of this bit of fake science news that he fed it to Time Magazine again a few years later. And of course, he turned out to be much more tragically quotable after he led the Human Genome Project through its initial stages. Well, this dovetailed with my own primary interest in just how we became apes, how we assimilated our genetic identity, how it became a genetic identity in the first place, and then privileged as a naturalistic identity. We actively decide to privilege genetic data and what they reveal well, ancestry, over ecological or psychological or anatomical data and what they reveal well, divergence, difference. That is quite arbitrary, but it is how we became apes. There was a cultural production of our genetic identity as apes, in which the rhetoric of the Human Genome Project transformed an absurd statement into the central premise of Jared Diamond's science bestseller, that not only are we apes, but we are specifically chimpanzees. And in 2009, fruit fly geneticist Jerry Coyne can write without a glimmer of self-doubt that our identity as apes is an indisputable fact. Well, far be it from me to dispute it, it's just not the kind of fact he thinks it is. It's a fact of nature and culture, a fact that was made historically in contrast to the fact decades earlier which held that in spite of our genetic intimacy and evolutionary embeddedness within the great apes, we have evolved to be very different from them. And that should be a more important aspect of our biological identity than our genetic intimacy. For example, 
We are driving them to extinction, not vice versa. So our identity as apes was not discovered but created by privileging genetic relationships over ecological relationships. Now this is an important modern recognition that scientific research is not independent of the cultural ideas it works with. Rather, those cultural ideas can subtly influence the science and can do so at all stages. Here, the crucial way is in the slide from genetics is a very important science to your DNA sequence is the most important thing about you. In fact, your DNA sequence may make you more specific than an ape. The very first book on Mendelian genetics by Reginald C. Punnett, inventor of the square, concludes like this. Permanent progress <laughs> is a question of breeding rather than of pedagogics, a matter of gametes, not of training. As our knowledge of heredity clouds and the mists of superstition are dispelled, there grows upon us with ever-increasing and relentless force the conviction that the creature is not made, but born. <laughs> now this is, oh, you should hear me do Claude Levi-Strauss. <laughs> this is a genetics textbook for college students. To the student, to the reader, this is the voice of science. But obviously this scientific statement also encodes a political theory. You cannot rise above your station in life, which is dictated by your ancestry. The child is born, not made. What happens to the child after birth is trivial, for it is genetically predestined. That is also what James Watson said to Time magazine in 1989 when he told them about our fate being in our genes. This is not value-neutral science. It's a science very much embedded and formulated in cultural ideas whose fundamental morality is open to debate. And between Punnett and Watson, we've got nearly the entire 20th century bracketed here. You can never be free of culture. The best you can do is to make those cultural influences on your science as subtle, as explicit, and as benign as possible. But you can't deny that they exist, because that would be the big lie. I like to group these cultural assumptions together as folk heredity. The ideas about ancestry and descent that people have that don't actually have a scientific basis. After all, even the fundamental idea that you are equally descended from each ancestor in a given generation only dates from 1896. All over the world, people simplify ancestry by imagining it as a line rather than as a tree. In the last few generations given here in the ancestry of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, biologically, Jesus would have had literally thousands of ancestors in addition to Jeconiah in that first generation over there. That's why we say kinship is cultural. Indeed, kinship is literally the oldest research question in anthropology. Its importance is clear to any fan of Game of Thrones in which Jon Snow's illegitimate parentage is raised in nearly every episode. <laughs> and he does not yet know that he is actually the nephew of his new girlfriend, Daenerys Targaryen. <laughs> Understanding how relatives are made, how something as seemingly natural as relatedness in fact invariably has very arbitrary and cultural aspects, was the first discovery of early anthropology. At very least, dividing people into relatives and non-relatives is a biological fiction in the first place, since we're all related. Consequently, the very act of regarding some people as kin and others as non-kin contradicts the biology. Indeed, the very diversity of the constitution of the family cross-culturally often contradicts biological relationships. So the science of genetics does not operate in a cultural vacuum. It works within the framework of what people already think about ancestry and descent. If you work with DNA, you need to know that people like martial arts announcer and YouTube personality Joe Rogan believe that fighting is in our DNA, and specifically in the DNA that we share with the apes. At one level, you're glad that he even believes in evolution. But, but on the other hand, his understanding of DNA is different from yours. <laughs>
and a lot more people listen to him than to you. <laughs> now, Joe Rogan is using the language of DNA as part of a moral discourse to convince you that mixed martial arts is a natural and normal part of being human and not an aberrant, horrid behavior like cannibalism, which, of course, no sensible person wants in their DNA. <laughs> and not too many scientists are prepared to engage in a moral discourse. He's saying this specifically to dispel the possibility that two people paid to beat each other up for the enjoyment of spectators might somehow be perceived and judged as barbaric. No. It's in our DNA. It's the way we naturally are. It's cool. Let it be. As I say, a moral discourse, and one that needs to be identified as such in order to make sense of it. Now, how do we distinguish folk heredity from scientific ideas? Well, we don't. Because unfortunately, the folk ideas are often embedded within the science itself. After all, much of Joe Rogan's understanding of DNA was shaped by the rhetoric of the Human Genome Project back in the 1990s, when there were all of these books explaining how your DNA sequence, the blueprint, the code, the map, the coded map, was the most important and fundamental thing about you. The point that I want to work towards then is that the question that people ask most about direct-to-consumer DNA ancestry tests, are they accurate? is not the right question to be asking, because that question is built on a lot of cultural assumptions about ancestry and science that can't necessarily be taken for granted. Now, your ancestry is a possibly interesting and possibly important part of you. Genetic data has been recruited to study paternity since the earliest days. In one famous case, an actress sued the silent movie star Charlie Chaplin for paternity but a blood test excluded him from paternity. Interestingly, the jury nevertheless sided with the woman because, after all, she was poor and he was rich. But that's another story. Everyone knows that genetics can say something authoritative about at least your recent ancestry. Can it say something about your distant ancestry, particularly given that every generation you go back in time, the number of your lineal ancestors doubles? So only a few generations back, any particular ancestor would be contributing a statistically negligible amount to your own genome. This is a paradox of genetic ancestry. The symbolic value of any particular ancestor is inversely proportional to their biological contribution. The premise of the Da Vinci Code had descendants of Jesus alive today. Wow. But we're talking about 80 generations and an absurdly large number of lineal ancestors of whom Jesus would simply be one. So for a more concrete example, when AfricanAncestry.com links you to your mitochondrial ancestor who came from Africa to America in, say, the year 1700, the first calculation you can make is how many ancestors did you have, say, 319 years ago? Well, conservatively figuring 25 years per generation, that would be about 13 generations, which means 2 to the 13th power lineal ancestors in that generation, which is literally thousands, even figuring for a bit of inbreeding. And on its best day, how many of those thousands of ancestors is that mitochondrial DNA identifying? exactly one, your mother's mother's mother's, et cetera, mother. An infinitesimal genetic contribution with strong symbolic power. If the, answer, if the question on the table is, is this result false, the answer is certainly no. They are scientifically extracting and analyzing your DNA and comparing it to samples on file from indigenous Africans and selling you the results. But here's what's interesting from their terms and conditions. The company will be harmless and no liability to the customer's use of or reliance on any report provided by the company or any opinion given by the company related to said results. I'm not a lawyer, but it sounds to me as if they're saying, we are selling you scientific results and interpretations, but we're not going to stand behind them legally. 23andMe says something similar. These results are for research, informational, and educational use only. They want to be especially careful to warn you not to take their medical information too seriously. <laughs>
The first generation of direct-to-consumer tests said that they were for recreational use. Now they tell you research, informational, and educational use. Don't take it too seriously. They are not legally responsible for the scientific results they are selling you. And this is where we need to pause and take a deep breath and appreciate that we have entered unfamiliar scientific terrain. When the scientific results come with legal disclaimers saying you can't take them too seriously. This is the science of the plausibly but not necessarily true. It's not the way we ordinarily think of scientific results. So this is where we start to ask, given that this is science, it's carried out by scientists using biochemical and statistical technologies, what kind of science is it? What are its properties that make it different from, different from the science of a generation ago? And the most obvious and fundamental observation is that this is for-profit science, neoliberal capitalist science, science that is marketing a product. That product is a story about your ancestry. Like any business, the primary goal is to keep the product moving off the shelves. The story that you purchase is based on the high-tech analysis of DNA, and it might well be true, which is why you can't sue them. They're selling you a story, and you can't prove that their story is not true. We don't have to be judgmental here, only observational. This is not your grandfather's human genetics. This is strange science. It's not the perception of a problem in the collection of data to solve it. This is collecting data and then sifting through it for patterns by which to construct a story. The patterns may be real or unreal, which is why this is at least as close to divination as it is to science. The human mind is very good at discerning patterns and at creating patterns, especially faces, if they don't exist. <laughs> a phenomenon known as pareidolia. This is not a process of discovery, but a process of pattern recognition and interpretation. And here's something even stranger. If you don't like the scientific story we're telling you, you don't have to believe it. We will give you plenty of reasons to reject this science if you choose to. That's exactly what the white supremacists, who discovered that they weren't as fully European as they had previously thought, quickly began to argue. And that is why the question, is this accurate, misses the point. It might be. We can talk sampling or algorithms or markers or pedigree collapse or standard error, and you can reject your scientific results if you don't like them. Acceptance is optional. This is not science like vaccinations and heliocentrism and climate change. This is neoliberal science. Science is about discovery. Capitalism is about markets and profits. Can they coexist? Certainly. The problem is the conflict of interests. Even Jesus recognized that problem in the Sermon on the Mount. He said you can't serve both God and money because, and I'm paraphrasing here, your piety is going to be corrupted by that big bag of cash on the table. So if you can't serve God and money simultaneously, can you serve genomics and money? And this is where a perusal of their advertisements shows the conflict of interests. Yes, the advancement of science is hindered when they make advertisements that reinforce ethnic stereotypes genetically, as in, wow, I'm 7% Chinese, no wonder I'm so analytic. <laughs> we want you to buy our product, and we will say anything to accomplish that end. And even if we won't stand by the results legally, you better not take your 6% Native American DNA test and try and steal a scholarship intended for real Native Americans. We can give you a great reason to do it yourself. Because it's so much fun. And you can learn who you really are. Now, nobody is saying that academic science is, or ever was, pure. It just doesn't have to deal with this particular interest conflict, a science of advertising campaigns and the goal of increased market share. Also, science and business have a long history. And in fact, the leading history of science journal just published a special issue on the subject of the entangled histories of science and capitalism. I'm also not telling you that this is bad science. I'm a cultural relativist. It's a different kind of science. It's got good and bad features. On the good side, it's getting people interested in genomics, evolution, and science 
who might not otherwise have been interested in those subjects. On the bad side, if the science they're getting is false or unreliable, does this serve the interests of science? My point is that we all know whose interests the corporate science will serve, those of its stockholders. The hope is that their interests and those of science will be concordant with sufficient regularity as to advance them both. Because when they don't align, you can be pretty sure whose interests will take precedence. Jesus certainly knew. This is simply not the kind of science that you're used to thinking of science as. These direct-to-consumer genetic ancestry tests explore the meaning and the boundaries of science, while unproblematically representing themselves as science to the public. And so after all this, why are the genomic ancestry tests so controversial? Because their results are simultaneously both authoritative and unclearly reliable. They're authoritative by virtue of being genomics and DNA. And they're of unclear reliability because they're strictly inductive and consequently are a hybrid of science and fortune telling. 23andMe is telling me what my genomic wake-up time is. James Watson believed personal futures were to be decoded from our DNA, and this is about personal presence and pasts being decoded from our DNA. But the only way you can have any scientific confidence in the ancestry results is to go to a different company and see if they match. And sometimes you get results like this writer for the Washington Post, who knew her father's family was Italian and her mother's family was Dutch and took her saliva to two different companies that promised to break down your European ancestry. Where one company had her at 45% Northwest European, the other had her at 32%. Where one had her at 29% Southern European, the other had her at 55%. And both gave her a bit of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry that she had never heard of, perhaps one great-grandparent. In another widely publicized example, Three identical triplets were given a genomic ancestry test for a television show. The test showed that they had very predominantly Northern European ancestry, although you hardly needed a DNA test to determine that. More, more significantly, as the categories became more finely detailed, they also became more discordant, even though these three women are genetic clones. So their French and German ancestry, and again, that's what the company was specifying, ranged from 11% to 22%. To understand this as science, we would ideally like to see error bars around such statements to tell us that in this science, 11% and 22% are effectively the same number. <laughs> Just last month, a Canadian journalist, oh, wait, there we go, a Canadian journalist and her identical twin sister, both rather Mediterranean looking, took DNA ancestry tests from five companies, yielding two sets of comparisons, twin to twin and company to company. And obviously the twins generally match. But once again, the finer the purported discrimination, the larger the disparity. And across companies, their Italianness ranged from 3% to 37%, and their Balkan and Greekness ranged from 23% to 80%. Why? Because of the naturalistic reification of cultural categories. Reification means attributing the properties of real things to things that are unreal, or in this case, misidentifying the nature of their reality. Here we have genetically diverse, historically situated nation states treated as if they were timeless and unified gene pools. This is an old fallacy. The 19th century anthropologists assumed that the basic structure of the human species was that it was fundamentally divisible into a fairly small number of fairly discrete natural groups. They called them races. It's a complex history, which I think we'll talk a little bit about tomorrow. But the word had a very flexible usage, referring to the ostensibly natural units of our species, yet invariably politically invested with varying degrees of subtlety. So about 150 years ago, after the French had just lost the Franco-Prussian War, the French anthropologist Armand de Cartrefage decides to refight the war on the battleground of science. <laughs> 
And from his sample of European skulls, he concludes that the Prussians are not even actual Europeans, but ancient immigrants and interlopers like the Finns, and do not even belong in Europe, much less in Germany. It didn't help the actual war results, but it does illustrate the politics inherent in the venture of merely proposing to identify and analyze the units of the human species scientifically. After all, the French are not a natural unit of anything. They're a geopolitical unit. Of course, there will be a great deal of error associated with French ancestry because France is a nation and a diverse nation at that. This is not the scientific process of sampling in which we expect that our data is an unbiased estimate of the whole because we don't even know what the whole is here. This is the humanistic practice of synecdoche in which the whole is metaphorically symbolized by its part. Of course, you can treat the population of France as if it were a naturalistic unit and analyze the properties of its gene pool and compare it to other gene pools and to an unknown sample. But to say on that basis that someone is 29% French is to misrepresent the historically circumscribed nation state for a unit of nature and ancestry, which is just as false for genomes as it was for skulls. So there are these levels of ab abstraction that don't map onto one, an one another particularly well, but which we take to be equivalent in genomic ancestry testing. Calculating similarity to the reference samples, inferring ancestry from the progenitors presumably represented by the reference samples, and imagining into existence an underlying naturalistic unit that one can actually have ancestry from whatever it is that the samples are actually supposed to be sampling. It is a problem if you misunderstand what it is you're buying. You're buying a story. They even tell you that. You're purchasing the story of your ancestry. And like all stories of ancestry, it contains mythic elements. This is sacred narrative territory and legal territory. After all, there are no official rules governing quality control on non-medical genetic testing. So you could, in theory, claim to sell a genetic test for pretty much anything and do it without much fear, because this is a science in which true and false don't really matter so much anymore which is why Vinome.com can sell you wines based on their analysis of your genome. <laughs> Who's to say that their story is wrong? A local news station in Chicago sent a bunch of samples out to different genetic testing companies to compare the results. Only one of the companies failed to tell that the DNA they were analyzing was from a dog. And they're still in business, now doing DNA tests for personality. And they have a very comprehensive disclaimer, which I won't bore you with. You can imagine what it says. So let me summarize now by answering three questions as best I can. First of all, is it doable? Can we crudely geographically localize parts of your genome? Well, yes. We've always known that there's geographical patterning to the human gene pool. The claim to have isolated it is reasonable and certainly not without precedent. In 1939, a leading American anthropologist, Ernest Houghton, soberly showed how parts of a face were derived from the Iranian plateau, the Alps, and the Arabs of the Mediterranean. Perhaps this DNA story is more reliable. Which brings me to the second question. Is it reliable? If the project is doable, does this do it? And once again, the answer is yes to a first approximation. It is like a look in a very expensive mirror. That's why you have journalists like this one, knowing that he's white, being told by one company that he's 66% Northwestern European and 3% Eastern European, and another company saying that he's 22% Northwestern European and 15% Eastern European. If 3 and 15 are the same number, then this science is using numbers differently than most science does. Finally, is this good? And here's where I feel some pessimism. From the standpoint of science, I don't think this is good for science. Now, who died and left me spokesman for science, aside from Elvis? This is a science that might be true. 
that nobody gets hurt if it's wrong and some people are making a lot of money from. It has some value for certain people, especially adoptees. But for everyone else, I'm not against people making a disreputable buck. That's pretty much the American dream in a nutshell. <laughs> but this ultimately erodes confidence in science. And although I'm as much of a relativist as the next fellow, I think it's a good idea at any point in time to have as much confidence as possible in science. So I don't see this project selling ostensibly scientific narratives of ancestry with unreasonably high precision as working towards that end.